Kaylin's question. Um, I just I question. Um, why would the icon structure begin to represent the feeling of Jane Jacobs' target, so she speaks to the order and eyes of the street? Are we so driven away from rigidity that we're willing to sacrifice more? Wow, that's a complex question. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, simplify it. What do you mean? Yeah, one of them. How do we? I think it's just going to be like really tall. Yeah. Well, we can talk on phone. Yeah. 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 Is that okay? Yes, yeah, I have one that might be easier. Well, is there a way to get it down to that? Okay. Um, is there a wrong way to create someone who can have this net positive? Yeah, brown pants. Yeah. Oh my God, why do we always do this? I don't know. Wore pants? I, yeah, I don't know. We're thinking. I love my bike. Wish. Jesse, you got a simpler version of it? Yeah. Why? Do you my only thing is like sac like if I'm if I'm gonna put it in like two words like sacrificing for change change. No, it's like financial icons. Yeah. Even though it's a financial icon, that doesn't mean it, yeah. it needs to not follow Jane Jacobs' ideas, right? I'm just saying right. they all they all do because that's what attracts them. Right. Like right. It's like kind of like this one. It's like the reason we're building it is as a financial investment, but it happens to follow Jane Jacobs' principles. Is that what you're saying? Okay. Okay. I said, has the idea of an icon building being made by a financial investment strategy become a further percentage of cities that are? It answers itself. Yeah. The whole point is maximizing financial value. We don't care who lives there. We don't care about housing people. Actually, it's better if no one lives there. It's a better investment. Okay, we're collecting questions. You can tell me your question or you can write it on the board. We're collecting questions. Yeah. <laughs> you think of what I'm thinking? Why you finish? Yeah, I know. Oh, I got where you're spending money. Can real estate ever be set up? Can you say it's not so hard to start to do real estate? Not to sell the market and take it with it? Like well, real estate, it's built into the word, it's market driven, right? So, can how about can housing um, instead of driving inequality? It, can it be, uh, can it drive greater equality? Yeah, yeah, you accept that? Yeah. I love that question. I think that is the question of your careers. This is where the United States needs to go. Well done. But that was a joint effort, right, you two? Uh, yeah, yeah. You encouraged her to say it. Okay. This, this, I love these questions. More. More questions.
I'll work with you to simplify it. You tell me in your raw in the raw state it's in. It's the raw state of the question. This is old. What's the raw state of the question? I want a question to be back. I want a question to be back. For all of these ones. I'm not going to start until I get a question from you. In the meantime, while they're thinking, do you have a question? Of course. Target question. Because we're running out of classes to figure this out. I mean, we better have this all figured out, all questions answered by the end of the semester. Isn't that what you Questions? Back row. Yeah. They have good questions too, but I don't know why they I have a little. I didn't even have one. Yeah, this one's old. This one's pretty much about what was the last word? It's a different, uh, would a different economic system result in different design criteria? Sure. What do you think? Okay, one more, one more question from, yes. Whoa. Oh, that's hard. What's the interplay between capitalism and uh, racism? How's that? I'm capital C capitalism or small C capitalism? Like capitalism we're, we're experiencing today, this weird thing, or capitalism more generally markets? Capital C, okay. Well, I don't know if we're going to get into that this lecture, but we'll see. We'll see. Okay. Anybody else have a question to add? Okay, before we launch into this, do you have any questions about the term project? Like they're, they're not 
is uh, oh, that's not a great um, well, so no one would expect to share this type of bit. No, there are, there are, but not like the other things Well, I hope not. Art daily, but that's superficial. Please don't use art daily as your. Your sketch writing for your term about that. Or like some of the sources are not in English. Okay. Not in English? There's another language? That's fine. We acknowledge that there are smart people writing about this. We have been several thousand languages, so many times by the case of a legitimate scholarly thought. Um, for example, <laughs> the Guardian newspaper. Is in English. They send journalists to Uzbekistan. And there are journalists in Uzbekistan right now concerned about the issues of foreign And I have a box that's really cool. I put in uh, an article in another language, and it will give me a rough translation of my tools. Should try. It's amazing. So I have this box on the table that you can put in any language and it gives you English. I actually have one in my pocket usually. I like got injured and I was I needed to talk about you know, should we go to the emergency room or not? There's a um I just it just has like a proper update. Hit it, it will translate. She's got it too. Okay. You don't. No, I'm, I'm saying like the sources that I understand. That's okay. We can translate. I would love to learn about respect. And when you say, um, can they all be from the same place? Does that mean you're going to do more than one analysis? Well, there's a few analysis. No. She does three analyses. You're in good trouble. You want him to get in trouble? Do one analysis. Go do three analyses. What is it? There are three paragraphs. Oh. There's the analysis paragraph. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Three candidates for analysis. You do all three. You choose one. You choose one of the three and you do an analysis with one. Best it's not a chance. It could be a group. Yeah. Gonna be a group project. Is this a group project? No, it's an individual project. If you want to work with someone else, talk to me because that's okay too. Good. You could do two analyses. Two separate analyses that uh, cover a similar set of principles. And then you could jointly write uh, something before that the analysis and jointly write something after the analysis. But the analysis itself is an individual analysis, just like every week. Yeah. It's the same assignment as you've been doing all semester, the same criteria. Just it's worth more points now. So you've these have all been just practice for the one that counts. Right. So if if you're if you haven't read the instructions yet for this assignment, I suggest you read the instructions. Other questions about the term project? Should we look at it? We don't really have time. I'm counting on you to to ask questions. Should I? Should I trust you that you're going to ask questions? When's the first, when's the first, I'll ask you questions. When's, what's the first, when is the first part of the term project due? 
What? July 21st. And what's new on July 21st? Images and readings. Images and readings. What does that even mean? Not sure. What's that? Do we have to read three readings and analyze three images? No. I want you, so on July 21st, I would like you to put into the slideshow, the zero zero forum slideshow, pull, you know, grab one of the slides and list three three candidate readings, three things you're considering, you think might be good for sketch writing. You don't, you don't have to do the sketch writing. You just have to list three in bibliographic form. One, two, three. Questions about that? Did someone ask what is bibliographic form? Ask a friend. Because most of your colleagues understand what a bibliography looks like. It's last name first, and then you alphabetize that, like you see in the WhatsApp chat. We're sending you examples of bibliographies. I hope that's helpful. Um, okay. So when is July 21st? What's today? Sixth. Sixth. So 21st, that sounds like a what day of the week is that? That's Friday. Friday. Is that right? It's Friday. Okay. Yeah. Is that okay that something's due on a Friday? <laughs> so, and then three images? What are the three images? Three like candidates for analysis. Three candidates for analysis. That means Maybe I'll analyze this image, or maybe not. Maybe I'll analyze the second image, or maybe I'll analyze the third image. Please do not analyze the three images. Here's a hint as to how much, this is worth four points. It's not supposed to be a huge amount of work. It's supposed to be, uh, I'm thinking something like this, it might, Take a while, but most of the work comes after this part. When's the next deadline after the 21st? When is it? 27. And what's due on this 27? Sketch writing. Sketch writing. So on the 27th, I've chosen this reading and I did a sketch writing. So the idea is that uh, these readings are substantial. Is Arcadia substantial? No. It's places, you know places? That's also online journal. That's substantial. Places is substantial. Art Daily, not really. So we're hoping for something significant. It's something like, uh, in, it should be solid enough that I want to bring it in and put it on the syllabus and use it in class. It should be like one of those uh, 10 to 20, 10 to 30 page readings that we do. Um, instead of doing three pages for the term project, you're gonna do the whole reading. You're gonna do the sketch writing on your, on your own for the whole 10 to 30 page reading. Yes. Should it be longer than yeah, it should be longer than three pages. It should be 10 to 30 pages. But like the actual sketch writing? The like sketch the writing should cover the whole reading. If the reading is... And here's what's going to happen next week. Um, we have like 120 pages of a book. By now, you should be really good at identifying target questions and going in and instead of having three pages to sketch write about, you're going to have... Uh, maybe 15 pages to sketch write about. You should be able to go into those 15 pages and say, 
don't care about this, don't need that. This is beside the point. This looks interesting. This is really important. Don't need this. This looks interesting. And just capture the part that uh, addresses the target question, which next week will be, hey, how did the city take on this appearance that looks totally random and haphazard, but is actually the direct outcome of very specific rules and laws? What is the relationship between the rules and laws and the form of the city? It's like a, a puzzle that you will be decoding. And uh, it's one of the more interesting topics, of course. And, uh, but the reading will be huge. Uh, you will be selectively choosing what part of the reading to capture for your sketch writing. And you can do this, you can use those same skills. You can have a, a 50 page reading and generate three pages of sketch writing or six pages of sketch writing out of three pages of reading because you don't have time to, to waste. I'm not going to capture everything that's in this reading. I'm going to capture the things that are going to help me succeed. Yeah. For, the, for the reading, you have the freedom to choose whatever it is. Yes. It should be something that is dependable. It shouldn't be a comic book. It shouldn't be a piece of fiction. It should be a dependable uh, piece of scholarship uh, is what I would normally say, but I want to be more of a journalist. Oh, yes, there's a whole bibliography with the department. So it's not, have to be from it doesn't have to be from that list. The reason that list gets better every year is because you guys are our research assistants. You go out and you follow uh, your intuitions and you bring us articles about Uzbekistan. And we say, wow, this is really good. And we add it to the readings. I'm not sure if there's supposed to be a correlation. Um, <laughs> the idea is that uh, I'm interested in this issue, this topic. And that's why I'm choosing these readings. And that's why I'm choosing synonyms. Here's a pro tip. Choose your images first. Look at the images. Project, think ahead about what it is, what issues are going to come up as you analyze these images. And then uh, choose your readings according to the positions. That way, there's a connection between the, the sketch writing and, and your analysis. And on a good day, you're actually able to put a drop a footnote into your analysis that comes from your sketch writing. You're not obligated to do that, but that would be cool. Other questions about this? What's the next deadline after the 27? You don't care. It's so far away. It's, you're not allowed to even think about it yet. But let's, Narmeen is thinking about it, right? She's ahead. Let's follow her lead and uh, follow where that leads. August 1st. So August 1st, let's do then. The analysis. It must be much bigger than the normal analysis, right? No, it's the same analysis. So it's just worth more points. And then, when is your final re review? You have a date for that? It's too far away, you don't even know. I mean, it knows. I'll just kind of. What is it? Ten. So, 
you guys and your instructors don't want me anywhere near that day. So, um, maybe like after it. After it? Yeah. Like how much after it? How about the 11th? No, like a, like a, at least a few days after. Like, how about the 15th? Oh, okay. Let's make it the 15th. Um, so, this is new territory. You know, you know how? You know how this is one of the hardest classes you've taken? Is that true? Like a lot of work? But it's the same assignment over and over again. So the idea, the proposition of this course is uh, it's a lot of work, but it's there's no surprises, right? You read the instructions, hopefully the first time you do each of these two assignments, the sketch writing and the analysis, and you get it okay, you do okay the first time, then you read the feedback that you're getting and you get it even better the second time. And by the fifth time, you've got it, right? Because you read the instructions, you're reading the feedback every week. And, uh, and so by the fifth week, pretty much got it. And you just stack up those A's and, um, and then, you do the final project and it's the same as every other project. There's a sketch writing, same as the prior, prior weeks of sketch writing, just longer and you're on your own. And there's an analysis, it's the same as every week. No surprises, right? When's the last time you took a course like that? Never. Well, history 32 is a little bit more. Up until the final thing, there are three paragraphs in the final thing. Here's the instructions about the three paragraphs. The easiest of three paragraphs is paragraph two because you've already done it. Paragraph two is finished. I will have graded it by this point and you will hopefully read the feedback on paragraph two and correct it and do an improved version of paragraph two. So that, that part's familiar. Now there's something brand new and different. The analysis is due August 1st. Okay. So you're just doing one paragraph, one analyzed image, same as it ever was. Uh, so now you're, you're revising your analysis paragraph and it's gonna be beautiful. Yes, you're doing a video, same as it ever was. Now, with absolute perfect understanding of what paragraph two is about, get us ready to deal with paragraph two by writing paragraph one. What is the situation? Remember the first beginning weeks of the semester, you were in the habit because you're very good students. You paid attention to your teachers from kindergarten all the way through 14th grade. And you did this perfectly for those 15 years. You read something, you learn about something, and then you, you, you summarize it in a paragraph and then you add a picture to illustrate it. You got very good at that. And then this course comes along and you get punished for doing something that you've been trained to do the whole time. And I kept saying the same words over and over again. This is a different kind of writing. This is analysis writing. You translate the insights of the image into each sentence of the paragraph. There is no sentence in the paragraph that isn't supported by the evidence in the image, except for one sentence. And then you use a footnote. And hopefully that's clear to everyone. Now, to get us ready, to deal with paragraph two, you give us the situation, you frame the situation. Now, all those skills you developed for those 15 years from kindergarten through 14th grade, use those skills and set up the situation historically. Say, we can say in 1853, uh, this court city you know, went through this experience and uh, the housing was built close to the port. 
you know, you can tell us things that you couldn't tell us in paragraph two. Paragraph two is a different animal. It's a different species of writing. It's totally different. So paragraph two is still an analysis paragraph. Now set up the situation, write a paragraph presenting the historical forces that resulted in the conditions out of which the design changes examined in the analysis were made. Add an image in the proper caption that serves as visual evidence and support of your characterization of the situation. So uh, you don't need to tell us that King Ferdinand II uh, abdicated his throne to his uh, uncle who showed up. We don't care. That doesn't help us with the analysis. Tell us the historical forces that help us understand and the situation when the designers made the intervention that you're analyzing in paragraph two. So you, we still don't want to know everything you know. It's not about showing off what you know. It's about framing the situation specifically so that we can really understand and appreciate what's happening in your analysis. Question about paragraph one? It's a different kind of writing than the analysis part. Okay, then paragraph three. This is the payoff. This is where we translate the analysis that we've been doing all year, all semester. We translate the insights of the analysis into a set of principles and a diagram that we can then put in our pockets, carry with us as we venture forth into our careers. Uh, and make important changes in the world. And so that's the purpose of paragraph three, is you're translating the analysis, the insights coming out of the analysis into a principle that you can apply. Does that make sense? Questions about this? So everything's clear? So uh, when things are not clear, uh, when you have questions, put them in the WhatsApp chat and one of your classmates will answer or I will answer. Okay. I'm excited. This is going to be great. I hope. Okay. <clears throat> okay, let's switch gears and go to the lecture. And let's put away our devices. Back row, can you tell us your divided seats, please? Kate, okay, are you taking notes for developing the question? So uh, the framework for all these questions, all these target questions, <clears throat> just to remind ourselves once again, what it is we're doing and why. Um, the world is filled with problems. Did you hear that? Two days ago, it was the hottest day 
on what what was it? Not here. It wasn't that hot. It was hottest average world. The hottest average world temperature. When was the second hottest average world temperature recorded? Yeah, just like not that long ago, the second hottest day in 125,000 years, something like that. So historians looking at fossil records have gone back 125,000 years and estimated the average daily temperature of the planet. And not too long ago, we hit the second hottest day in history. And then two days ago, the hottest day in history. Crazy. So what's going on here? Is, is this normal? No, it's not normal. Something is terribly, horribly wrong. Is it okay if we just keep doing what we've always been doing? Is it okay? No, that would just be wrong. Can we study architecture the same way we always did? No, that would be wrong. So in that tech, in that context, the challenge for this course that I think is worth taking seriously is how do we change the way we do architecture and how do we use the way we study architecture as the basis, as the launching pad for actually producing architecture differently than it has been produced in the past. In the past, architects were taught to be passive cogs in the system. Remember we had, we had, <clears throat> we had this diagram. We were taught that architectural projects are given to us by the system and we produce the architecture as required by the system. And no questions, right? And there are, there are there's good architecture and bad architecture, but we used to produce architecture uh, as a process of translating poetic metaphors. Believe it or not, this is the way architects were trained for decades in the 20th century. Architects were highly skilled at taking poetic metaphors and translating them into beautiful form. Thank you very much. I mean, I mean, you're welcome. That's what we did. And in the meantime, we turned a blind eye to the fact that these beautiful projects were part of a larger system. That without the architecture, the system doesn't work. We ignored that. When we studied the history of architecture, what we did is we looked at the Pantheon. Oh, beautiful. Beautiful metaphor for cosmological forces of the universe built into concrete form in the pantheon. Beautiful metaphor, beautiful translation of a poetic metaphor. The Parthenon, ah, oh, beautiful translation of a poetic idea into form. Shard Cathedral. And you go through the whole, the whole history of architecture. That's how we studied it because that's what we thought architects do. We create beautiful poetic translations of metaphors into beautiful form. Do we do that? Yeah, we do, but that's not all we do. So now, now that we're faced with a, a century of crisis, now that this, the hottest day in human record was two days ago, what do we need to do? We gotta do it differently. So we don't look at history the same way. We do appreciate beautiful, powerful translations of poetic metaphors. We, that's what architects do. We're good at that. Don't stop doing that. Did the architects in Medellin, Colombia stop producing powerful, beautiful buildings? Oh, that's the secret of their success. They are still making powerful, beautiful buildings, but they're doing it in a larger context that's aware that architecture is part of an operating system. And they target their projects, their beautiful 
beautiful poetic metaphors are not just beautiful poetic metaphors because they are targeting the least privileged communities in Medellin, Colombia. And by doing that, they are transforming, they are flipping the whole situation. Instead of giving world-class architecture to the wealthiest 5% of society, they're giving world-class architecture to the impoverished majority of the city, right? Same beautiful architecture. They took the gondola ski lift, they moved it from the fancy neighborhood. I don't know if it was gonna go and help Poblado. I don't know. But it was, they were gonna use the fancy gondola ski lift to service a fancy neighborhood, probably El Poblado. And they moved it from the fanciest neighborhood in Maine. They moved it to the most desperate uh, community where the most people had been killed of Santo Domingo. And then they did it again, and they did it again, and they did it again. And in doing so, they completely flipped the situation uh, in Medellin, right? Did you experience that? Yeah. Um, so we're still doing beautiful, powerful buildings, but we're doing it conscious of the fact that this arrow goes in both directions. And on a good day, we can actually have an impact on larger cultural forces. We can alter the situation. Sometimes it starts with culture, people who are concerned about global climate change and uh, climate injustice, the way that uh, the people who are producing the greatest amounts of carbon are not suffering the greatest consequences. The people who are producing the least amount of carbon are the ones who are being displaced and killed uh, by floods, famine, and warfare. Uh, and so there's, uh, climate is not just this technical thing to be solved by electric cars. It's also a social cultural force of driving deeper and deeper and deeper injustice. And uh, it gets into some of these, these questions about how, how are we going to flip this around, right? I think I'm, I'm responding in the way I framed this, this preamble to address this. Um, so when we look back in history, we look not just at the architectural scale, but the next scale up of, of uh, neighborhoods and fragments of cities. And then the next scale up from that, we look at entire cities and regional infrastructures. And how do the design, how, what is the interplay between design of our projects and these larger systems? And uh, one of the benefits of doing history backwards is, it's, uh, is that we're thickening, we're thickening the sense of now. The forces that we are facing, and by we, I mean you, in your careers in the 21st century, those forces didn't just begin this year. They didn't begin 10 years ago. They didn't, they didn't begin just 50 years ago. As we move through the weeks of the course and move back and back and back, we have a deeper understanding of an appreciation for how these forces have been operating for centuries. So this whole thing that you read about, this whole idea of financialization as uh, this machine that reproduces itself, because I can get wealthy purchasing homes that I will never live in, I'm going to keep purchasing those homes. And I'm going to tell my buddies at the country club, uh, that they can get rich too. If they diversify their portfolio holdings and buy more real estate, they can buy houses that they never live in and they can uh, balance out their portfolio. And over the long term, their, their wealth will be secured by investing in housing, this luxury housing at the top of one Dolphin Place or in the ultra thins in Manhattan. So the more this works as a financial strategy, 
the more it will happen. And the more the architecture firm that I end up working for because I need to pay off my student loans is gonna give me projects to do that I will be designing these fantastic apartments or these fantastic houses that no one will ever live in. No one will ever raise a family in them. It's just a financial instrument. So this is this giant system that reproduces itself and gets bigger and bigger and bigger under the operation of the system that produces architecture, some of which you will be designing. This is a giant money-making system. It's not the first time there's been a giant money-making system. Let's go back. Let's go back to ancient Greece. We've now worked our way uh, to the part of the semester where we're talking about 2,500 years ago. Um, so let's get into it. But first, I want to plant the seed of this question. What's going on here? Have you, who's driven across the country? You recognize this? It's where the road, the road is straight for 24 miles or something like that, just forever. And I'm driving along, I'm just driving along, right? The way we do, we just drive along 24 miles. And all of a sudden, what's going on here? All of a sudden there's a sharp right turn and then sharp left turn. Why can't the road just go straight? What is it? Zoning? That's a good, that's a good answer. Yeah. This came much later. State lines. State lines is a good, sometimes, what? Field markers. Field markers. Before the state lines, before the field markers, before the house, these lines were laid down. That's a hint. A natural, like there's a river. Something along. It's not a river. These lines were laid down without anyone before anyone came here. A drafting error, kinda, but it's a predictable drafting error. I mean, it's something that they they knew about. It's not a drafting. It's it's an adjustment or something. But you think about it. We'll we'll revisit this. So the biggest thing in this uh, lecture, the star of this lecture, is the grid. Right, grids are are good, right? You have about three or four weeks ago, your studio instructor said, "Where's your palm grid?" Right? How long ago did they ask, "Where's your palm grid?" Three or four weeks ago. Yeah. So grids are good. Grids are they make things more efficient, and um, we're going to look at Greece, ancient Greece. Greece was one of the first <clears throat> empires uh, based in Athens. They, you know, there are all these different language groups and societies, and basically they conquered. We're going to look into this more deeply in two weeks. Um, but every part of the Greek system has its role. And so these are the key components of Athens, uh, the Parthenon, beautiful, powerful translation of uh, a religious metaphor into built form, right? But when is architecture more than just a beautiful, powerful translation of a metaphor into built form? When it mobilizes other forces. It helps organize society. This as a symbol helped organize and control the population of the city below it. And uh, there are 
crucial elements. Uh, the theater was a crucial element. The stoa, the, uh, the basilica, uh, each building, and you, you did this in history theory one, uh, we're not gonna redo it. Uh, we're gonna add to the ideas that you looked at with history theory one into with an awareness of larger systems. So the brilliance of the Greek amphitheater, and we're gonna tie it back to some ideas from Jan Giel, the scale of the Greek amphitheater is the scale of the human ear and the human voice. There was no artificial amp amplification. You could not make this bigger uh, without limit because of the scale of the human voice and the capacity for human hearing enhanced by the shape of the architecture. This is very much scaled to the human senses and it played a very important role in uh, the communication of ideas about Greek society and resulted in art. It was partly responsible for the expansion of the Greek empire. They also used the grid as an organizing system. And within, uh, this is the city of Miletus. Miletus, how do I pronounce that? Who's, who's, who speaks Greek? Okay. Um, so these elements were organized on the peninsula and the grid is established on the peninsula. And the grid ignores topography. The grid ignores the landscape. If the features of the landscape are all wiped clean by the grid. Have you been to San Francisco? San Francisco is hilly. Uh, and every street is straight and because it's a grid laid on the hills of San Francisco, except for Lombard, yeah. Lombard Street. So that's the thing about the grid in relationship to the topography. Uh, you put it in the flattest piece of land you can find, but even when it's not flat, you ignore the topography. It's, you can't deviate from the grid. So the grid, and this is the key, the grid is a thing that is an abstract form that is laid down on something that is very specific, a very specific topography. And so we see lots of examples of that. We remember this, uh, we covered this in uh, history theory too, that uh, there's a modularity that took the Greek architectural structural system of trabiation. Can I say trabiation? What does trabiation mean? Trabiation is a, a structural system uh, where the vertical elements are different from the horizontal elements. And when we get to Roman systems, we see why trabiation of the Greeks is so different from the vaulting of the Romans. So the, this modular system that was inherent in the structural uh, limitations of Greek trabiated structural systems became uh, with the French uh, Durand method, uh, a very powerful method of modern uh, architectural layout uh, where you use this modular system to create very complex buildings. that we looked at. So um, the Greek system was capable of, of being, helped Greece to expand uh, beyond its city of Athens and to establish colonies all over the Aegean Sea. And uh, the Romans who came about uh, five centuries later after the peak of the Greeks, Rome itself is another very complex uh, city. Who's been to Rome? You're going to love it when you go. Um, has a lot of the same elements, the theater, the temples, the temple complexes, the agora uh, or agora. I'm never sure which way to pronounce it. 
Um, but Rome itself is dominated by these uh, seven hills and this river. It's a very complex thing. But um, for those of you who read, and there's the Noli map of Rome. We had the Parthenon uh, in the last one. Here we have the Pantheon. Um, and you have the Roman version of the Greek theater. This time, instead of having nature in the background, you glimpse nature down these streets uh, that lead to thresholds, and you glimpse the nature beyond the city uh, because they tend to put the theater at the edge of the city. Uh, and it helped to establish this idea of the relationship between humans, society, and the natural world. So Rome itself is a mishmash of very complex, gradual development, uh, a lot like what we looked at in Caracas uh, in week three. Um, and all this architecture that you studied. Uh, and then we, we looked at the City Beautiful movement and how the pilgrimage, remember the pilgrimage thing, uh, where the Pope said, you can have time off from your time in purgatory, come to Rome. And so to help you visit the seven holy sites in Rome, he built these boulevards by cutting them through the fabric of the city. So you can enter at the Piazza del Popolo, the Plaza of the People, and you can see three of the holy sites from one position uh, right there in the center of that plaza. So the visual corridor, which is a new, a larger scale of human vision, um, and that from there it went to Hausmann's Paris and then Chicago. This, a lot of this is review. Um, but the Roman, uh, the Roman system, let's go back to uh, the rise of the Roman Empire. Um, they had this machine that uh, they started in Rome. And they had this kind of uh, pyramid scheme, a chain letter. Um, we send our armies out, we conquer a, a town over here, we enslave its people, and we build a new town there. And we build the new town very quickly on a grid. And then we tell the people we just conquered, why don't you do what we just did? You know, we conquered you and we're sending wealth back to Rome. You go out and conquer the next valley and you send wealth to us and so on. And that's the strategy. That's the system operation by which the Roman Empire spread and spread and spread some more. And uh, got stopped at the force, the thick forests of Germany. Uh, got stopped uh, at Hadrian's Wall uh, in Scotland. But there wasn't much else to stop it. It was a very powerful system. And you should make a connection here with the system of icebergs, zombies, and ultra things. Financialization is a similarly powerful system. Left to its own devices, it will continuously devour the housing supply of the world, raising the prices, not just of one dolphin place, but of fairly rundown places on Mission Hill, because all those rents get pulled up together. So it's a similar system. So China, we're looking at this system as an architectural strategy, it uses the design of architectures and cities at the core of its operating system. And that's not that different from what financialization is doing with housing. For various reasons, the, the Roman Empire uh, declines and shrinks back to its original uh, city of Rome, and then even at that point uh, goes away. Uh, it's only uh, Constantinople, now uh, Istanbul, Turkey, that is left of the Roman Empire. So let's look at how architecture helped drive that expansion. 
one of the key ingredients of this were roads. Remember, uh, you've heard all roads lead to Rome. This was literally true uh, as a result of the expansion of the Roman Empire. The way it expands is by building roads and they built serious roads. There's something about slave labor that really uh, allows you to build good roads. And they invented, you saw the scene in Elf, the Will Ferrell movie, the Christmas movie, Elf, where he hops in the crosswalk. I don't think he ever took this class, but that is how crosswalks originally worked because streets were, uh, were drainage systems, sometimes draining raw sewage. And it was important to not get your feet wet when there's raw sewage in the streets. Uh, but also you need the wheels of the carts need to be able to pass down the streets. So the spacing of these stones was such that the, it matched the typical uh, width of the cartwheels and the stride of a human. So you could walk across without blocking the carts. Uh, this is the work of David McCauley. Did you have his books growing up? David McCauley, architect, graduate of RISD, second most famous graduate of RISD that does not practice architecture. Who's the first most famous graduate of RISD that doesn't practice architecture? David Byrne, Talking Heads, American Utopia, David Byrne, architect, yeah. But David McCauley, the other David, he took his architectural training and he wrote all these children's books. And we're gonna look at uh, what he has to say about um, Rome, Roman systems. They also, uh, so you said Greek trabiation, <clears throat> Roman vaults. So they uh, used brick to vault spaces and were able to achieve uh, remarkable feats of engineering. One of them being aqueducts that brought fresh water into cities, uh, even during sieges, they could uh, continuously have water. And this was based on some very sophisticated uh, surveying techniques where you want the water to flow. Uh, if it doesn't flow fast enough, it, it sits and cools and gets uh, contaminated. So it has to flow, but if it flows too fast, it erodes the mortar joints in the construction and the construction fails. So they had to, they had to figure out how to create just the right pitch so the water flows at a specific flow rate. Not too fast to erode the brick, but not too slow to get contaminated just right. And so to make it across these valleys and keep the same pitch, they used aqueducts. <clears throat> and these Soldiers are called centurions. And the centurions uh, would go to the next uh, encampment and they would lay out a camp uh, in a process called centuriation. They would choose a, a, a point of origin in the center of the camp. And from there, they would set up the Cardo Maximus, uh, north south, and the Decumanus Maximus, the main east-west street. And that's the center of the camp. They would use this device uh, in string lines, and they would sight along the string lines, great distances, very, very precisely, without lasers, just using the human eye uh, to lay out this grid of a camp. And so they would lay out the camp, and this is what David McCauley has given us. And so there's the uh, Decumanus and Ricardo at the center of the Roman camp and these square blocks. And within those, that block system, they established the theater, the amphitheater for sporting, uh, the aqueduct, um, the, uh, the thermal baths, the market, the forum, 
uh, the palace. So all of these places were part of the Roman operating system, which was one of the two readings we had. Who did the Roman operating system reading? Someone did. So this was, this is uh, the beautiful thing about that reading is they refer to this urban form as an operating system. Thank you, uh, Rem Kolahas and Harvard. You are acknowledging that urban form is a system. It is an operating system that lies at the heart of the Roman uh, operating system that helped Rome expand and take over all of the Mediterranean world. And one of the things to notice is when you get to the east-west part of the Cardo, you have a gate. So there's a gate in the middle to the west, a gate in the middle to the east, one gate at the north, one gate at the south. But once you leave the gate, you at that point, then you take off towards the next town, and you might deviate from the diagonal, but you're still trying to impose the grid beyond the camp itself. Does that make sense? And so these camps were established outside of Rome, outside of Italy, what we call Italy, all around the Mediterranean, up into the British islands. And it, this is, if this is the ideal grid, this is what would end up being because they were limited, once again, like the Greeks, by topography. If there's a cliff here, they, they wall off the city uh, at the top of the cliff, but the grid relentlessly marches right up to that border. So they don't build a parallel street parallel to the wall, they keep the grid gone right up to that wall. <clears throat> so it's the same as what we saw in Greece. In Timgad, uh, Algeria, we have a very clear Preser pre clearly preserved example of this. Uh, and so we, we often look at that uh, as a pure example of the Roman system in action. Uh, we can also look at the, um, the settlements throughout, you know, wherever it went, including in Britain, uh, the road system and the towns. It was often uh, adapted to local circumstances. So you see slight variations on the theme. Uh, if you look uh, around as you travel, this is a great party trick to entertain your friends. Um, you can go someplace in Europe, any place in Europe, I'm gonna say, pretty much any town in Europe. Uh, there are very few exceptions. And at the center of that town, you will find this, something like this. And you can know with great certainty, this is the original Roman camp. Uh, because you see the traces of this wall and uh, sometimes it's more intact, sometimes it's less intact. And then you see where the gate used to be and that's where the roads take off at a dying. And so it's very, it, it's, it's like a game you can play uh, in whatever city you go to. Here's back at Tim God. Um, there's a gate there, and you know there's a gate because the road heads off to the next town. Do you see it? Let's, let's test our skills. Back when we were in COVID, uh, people would turn on their pens and they'd draw in here and you'd have 38 people drawing at the same time, drawing lines, and it's really fun. But I could have you all come up and draw lines on the whiteboard, but I don't know, we don't have time for that. But you can picture it, right? Can you picture where you would be drawing lines? Yeah. So it turns out this one is pretty clear. Do you see the next one? Because the Romans did that. Then after the Romans, uh, the town got crowded and people uh, within the herbs, within the walls, uh, got too crowded. Some people who didn't want to be part of the herbs would build outside the herbs. And they were building in the 
suburbs. Thank you. And it started to get crowded outside the herbs and the suburbs. And all of a sudden, they become vulnerable to attack from competing towns. And so they built the wall to protect them. And it stopped there, right? That was the last time that happened. No, it kept kept happening. Do you see it? You see the next one? What town is this? Do you recognize this town? There's the next one. Here's a hint of what a town this is. See it? There's the next one. Now we're getting into like uh, 1800. And uh, you have the fields of fire, the camp because of canning technology. You have to, you can't let the suburbs grow out here. You have to keep it open or else the attackers can take cover in the houses outside the walls. So you have to keep uh, several hundred feet the distance of cannon and rifle fire. You have to keep it open with no trees or shrubbery to hide behind. And those are called the fields of fire. And that's where Vienna got its uh, development that we talked about a few weeks ago. So this is a famous cathedral by an architect by the name of Brunelleschi. Anyone, name that town? It's, it's Florence, Florence, Italy. Who's been? You'll go. You'll love it. Isn't that cool? You went up in the dome? Okay. Cologne, Germany, we could do this. We could do this all, all day. And okay. there's the Roman town. And you see there, um, and you really see this one around 1800. And some of the fields of fire are still there. And then after 1800, they filled in that one. And then this, and the railways tend to come in. And they, it's so expensive to, uh, to cut through the city with your railways that like we saw in Paris, the, rail, the seven railways of Paris come in to where the walls were. And that's where the railway, and you see that here. The railway comes to the, the famous station in Florence. It comes in here because it's too expensive to bring it all the way through town. And Boston, uh, the number one promise uh, made in the big dig was to connect North and South Station finally, so Amtrak could go right through um, from Washington, D.C. up to Portland. It was the first promise made and the first promise broken. And so when you fly over Italy, and I'm sure you will, you will see what's left of the Roman roads and the centurion system across the landscape. This is uh, Italy. This is what the map looks like. And this is what it looks like from the air. First came the, the grid. Second came the roads that follow those grids. Third came the, the agricultural divisions. Um, and so we talked about, was it two weeks ago? We talked about the Spaniards came to the new world. They encountered this amazing city, the biggest city in the world, Tenochtitlan, now called Mexico City. And it had a grid. And the grid uh, reminded the Spaniards uh, that their cities used to have grids. And they established the laws of the Indies. And they said grids are useful things for colonizing, uh, for colonizing Latin America. And so the laws of the Indies established this grid system. And this is the center of the Aztec city of Tenochtitlan, remade by the Spanish Catholic uh, colonizers, where they tear down the Aztec temples and use the stones to build the cathedral. And so this is the capital complex with the, government, the presidential palace uh, in Mexico City. 
And the laws of the Indies were used to establish uh, Caracas and every city around Latin America. And those grids remain in place. And the grid came back uh, from the colonies and made it into uh, Spain. And we see it, um, those of you coming to Spain, ignore this part. We're gonna spend the whole semester talking about this. Don't, you don't have to ignore it. But we're gonna go deep into this uh, study of Spain. But this is the Roman center of Barcelona uh, that then grew and expanded beyond the Roman walls uh, and became the old, the Gothic center of Barcelona with its Cardo and their Romanus. And then these were the boundaries of the old city. This is the boundaries of the Roman city and then expanded out to here where the walls were protecting from the sea. There was a sea wall. And this is now the Ramblas, very famous pedestrian corridor. That's where I lived last fall. And uh, this was the city of Barcelona up until uh, 1850 when it exploded uh, and they filled, they, they, they took, they expanded, they filled the whole valley of Barcelona with a grid. And uh, the grid allowed very quickly for the industrial development of the Valley of Barcelona, uh, because it was a crisis. Um, they needed to industrialize, but they couldn't permit and build quickly enough. So they used the grid. And the grid was a very powerful tool for rapid expansion of the city, and it worked. Um, more about Barcelona. But not all grids are the same. And there's something brilliant about the grid in Barcelona that allows for uh, this, uh, this, inner, this inner realm and these streets. Uh, unfortunately, they privatized the inner block. The original idea of the inner block was that it would be a shared garden or shared facilities. It could have schools, it could have things uh, that were protected from the increasingly hostile noise and filth of the streets uh, by being creating this sanctuary inside the block. Um, and that's something we'll be looking at when we go to Spain. Um, So now we get to how the grid was used in the United States. So uh, again, you see the kind of uh, fairly haphazard development here when this was a Dutch uh, port, there's the canal, uh, that is Canal Street because there was a canal there because it was Dutch. Uh, and there was a wall, so there's Wall Street. That's Wall Street. Um, and so as a Dutch settlement, it, it was a walled, uh, walled settlement at the tip of Manhattan. Uh, then they breached the wall, made it to canal. And then uh, before there was any reason to believe that this was going to be a success, they said, let's lay out a grid. So when they laid out this grid all the way up, Manhattan, the same things happened that we've been talking about in all of the grid systems previously with the Greeks, the Romans. First step one is you uh, you set out the surveyors and it, it signals the local indigenous populations, you're in trouble. You're gonna be evicted very quickly. So you send out the surveyors and send out uh, armed guards with the surveyors because they need to clear the land. So the land is being cleared as the survey team advances and lays out these streets. The second uh, thing that happens is you flatten the hills. And so you do cut and fill. And the idea of cut and fill is that if you have, uh, you, you try to balance 
the cut with the fill. Look, that, that looks bigger than this. So we're gonna draw the line here. And then you say, okay, yeah. And then you put this there. So you balance the cut and fill and you do that for all of Manhattan. But let's, let's carve out, um, let's carve out a little sanctuary. And so they, they left the topography. Well, they changed the topography there too for Central Park. The other thing that happens with the grid is uh, you create identical parcels. Um, did I know what the dimensions of this parcel is. It's 25 feet wide by 100 feet deep. I didn't have to go measure it. I lived in a parcel over here and it was 25 by 100 feet. And I knew that. Um, so I know how big that parcel is. I know the size of almost every parcel on this map. I can design a building for one parcel and it will work on any parcel. So uh, it's a system that allows a very rapid reproduction of, of housing design. And here's, uh, through the ages, we looked at this, how uh, they change the rules for light and air. This has a building right here and a building right there. So there's four windows per floor on the front and four windows per floor on the back. And in later models, they put windows in these air shafts. So it's only like uh, five feet wide, um, but there's a window on your building and a window across five feet away. And there's a little bit of sunlight coming down. Uh, this, is the, this is the apartment I lived <clears throat> when I was in architecture school. And the other thing about this is um, if you're interested in buying this lot, 20, it's 25 by 100 feet. Uh, I can, you know, I, if you wanted to buy that, I'm sorry, that one's taken, but I have one just like it right here. Actually, I have 38 different parcels that are all identical. Which one do you want? How many do you want? Do you want to go see it? Don't bother. They all look the same. There's no need for us to go to uh, 10th Street and take a look at the 25 by 100 foot parcel because it looks the same as every other 25 by 100 foot parcel. There's no reason to visit. I could sell it to you here when we're talking in Boston and nowhere near 10th Street. That's what the grid does. It makes every piece of land identical to every other piece of land, even if originally it was not identical, even if originally it was unique. We do cut and fill, we dislocate the locals, we do everything we can to make every parcel identical to every other parcel, in part because it means we already have buildings designed for that parcel, and uh, we can sell, buy and sell them. They're all the same price. The only thing that changes the price is how close you are to where the action is. Where's the 100% corner of the, of the city? And, and so you can actually graph, you can map the price by how close you are to Canal Street. The further you are from Canal Street, the less expensive things get, but it's a very even grade. And so you can do that at the scale of Manhattan. Yes, Sam. Was the intention that like, they would build the whole building like halfway to the, in the parcel? Because there's like so much empty space. And if they wanted like more money, you just make the parcel smaller, buildings to stay the same size, and then you get more money. Um, well, there were laws that said it used to be that it was like Manchester, England. It used to be you cram as many uh, rooms as you can, and then you cram as many factory workers as you can into those rooms. But as uh, housing reformers got involved 
uh, and trying to reduce the death and disease of cholera, especially, he would say you can't have a building back here. And so you can keep the building you had in the front, but you can't, you got to demolish this building after 1850. Then after 1850, you're allowed to build the buildings like this, but you need to have that uh, 30 foot setback. And then it became uh, a 10 foot setback, and then a five foot setback, and then went back to 10 foot setback. And the light shafts got bigger, and instead of 25 foot black posts. So the laws were passed uh, that said, uh, that changed the, dim the dimensional requirements of is basically, this is part of zoning laws, the dimensional requirements. Uh, you have zero setback on the on the side lots, except where there's air shafts, and uh, a minimum 10 foot setback in the back. And so that's what creates the different pattern is these were built at different times, and some of them were grandfathered in. So, Sam, does that answer your question? Yes. <clears throat> so, if you take the same logic and you uh, extend it, as did Thomas Jefferson, and we learned about this in history theory. Thomas Jefferson was president of the United States and he said, um, this is cute that the English say, I'll go seven chains uh, north, northwest until you get to the tree and then turn right like 73 degrees and, and head 13 chains in that direction until you see the stone wall. It's very cumbersome. Thomas Jefferson, who was a great admirer of French rationalism, which uh, we understand from James C. Scott seen like a state, um, was a very large systemic way of looking at the world, especially when it comes to uh, managing and uh, controlling nature and controlling the landscape. And so this was a strategy developed uh, in the 1800, uh, 18th century, 1789, I think, Jefferson uh, promoted this. And it wasn't embraced until a, a while after that, when the United States expanded beyond the Appalachian Mountains. And as we move beyond the Appalachian Mountains, you notice what happens to the maps of the United States. All of a sudden, instead of following rivers, we're following straight lines. That's because of this system. So this is a hint as to why the road takes a sudden right turn and a sudden left turn. This is a hint. I'm gonna give you another hint. Have you ever <clears throat> tried to gift wrap a basketball or a soccer ball? Like if you're giving someone a ball for Christmas, you ever tried to gift wrap it? What happens? Yeah. So that's a hint. Let's go this way. <clears throat> so this National Land Ordinance System, uh, 1785, um, is responsible for the laying out of the United States beyond the Appalachian Mountains. So what do we do? Just like we did in Greece and in Rome or the Roman Empire and the island of Manhattan, you send teams of surveyors out, make sure there are some armed guards, maybe send the cavalry ahead of them and clear out the savages, which is what they were called, and lay at the grid from sea to shining sea. And then within that, you can do all kinds of crazy things. Thank you, architects of the United States. Um, but basically the grid is, is the rule, is the league, it's, it's the law. And um, any guesses? I think, I think the uh, <clears throat> soccer ball, yeah. It is. It's two very 
structured systems colliding, but these structured grids are from the same pen. The map maker who drew this grid is the same map maker who drew this grid. And he drew it on the same day, same city. It's not like he lost track of where he left off and didn't bother to line this one up with that one. It's not a drafting error. It was very much on purpose. Soccer ball, basketball. <clears throat> and so we're using sight lines again, the uh, sight on Pikes Peak. There's there's uh, there's Peak was one of the sight lines. Uh, I used to live right near Baseline Road in Boulder. Uh, these baselines were the the points of registration for the grid, the local grid. And you've seen these all over, right? These are the monuments by which all architectural projects start with a surveying team. Uh, and they set up the tripods. And you see them, the engineers on Wentworth campus. It's the starting point of every project. They're all facing, at least west of the Appalachian Mountains, they're facing their grid lines on uh, the great grid. So here's the answer. It's not obvious though. <clears throat> <clears throat> Why does it shift? So there it is. It's on the north south. It's on the north south lines. If you're driving across the country, you're fine because uh, latitude lines are parallel to each other. It's the uh, longitude lines that are problematic. This is a straight longitude line, the principal meridian. Why is that? Who, who sews? Okay, if you sew, what do you need to do when you sew? Are bodies flat? Usually not. It's a pleat. These are grid corrections because it gets smaller as you move away from the equator. Does that make sense? Everyone gets it now? Yes, it was so important to make sure every piece of land is identical to every other piece of land. No, that would mess up with our system. The point of the system is that 40 acres is 40 acres. Every plot of land is 40 acres or some multiple of 40 acres. So in order to make sure that every piece of land is absolutely identical to every other, other piece of land, you have to <clears throat> take extreme measures to make sure that those 40 acres, you know, there may, it might be 39.9 acres uh, in some places, but you're willing to shift the grid just to make sure that every piece of land is identical to every other piece of land so that it can be bought and sold. And so uh, that's how the United States became a machine of land and property commodification, is that uh, traders in sitting in rooms in New York and Boston and Baltimore could buy and sell 40 acre plots or 640 acre plots or 4,000 acre plots. They could buy and sell huge amounts of land without ever seeing it, without sending out a team to measure it to make sure it's exactly what they 
but because this this continent is a giant machine for buying and selling land, which connects this topic, this geometry of map making from Greece to Rome to Manhattan to the United States, it ties it all together with what we studied in the first week about Dubai. Why is the Burj Khalifa that tall? It's because of, of the sovereign wealth fund needed an investment that was worth this amount of money. So it's the architecture is not some driven by human needs. The architecture is driven by these abstract ideas laid onto the landscape. So that's why the original missionary settlement of Los Angeles looked like this, but then the abstraction of financial investment uh, was imposed on the valley around the historic settlement of Los Angeles. And so this is how the United States was able to expand and grow so quickly. Here in the darkness of the West beyond the Rocky Mountains, you see San Francisco Bay. And here you see the Great Plains, and then you see the Brooklyn Bridge. And this painting is a story of civilization, the angel of civilization bringing light from the East, sweeping away the darkness of the savages, uh, bringing uh, covered wagons, the telegraph lines, the stagecoach, the fencing of the landscape, the steam locomotive, even as the tracks are still being laid, the steam locomotive, uh, and driving the darkness away. And the settlement of the continent uh, as depicted in fencing and lumber, uh, and then the whole story of Chicago, uh, which is a great story in and of itself. Um, and those of you who read uh, Cronin's Nature's Metropolis tells this story of how uh, the grid uh, allowed land speculators in Chicago to buy land in the morning for $10 and sell it in the afternoon for $50. Um, and that wasn't just happening in Chicago. It was happening in St. Louis and countless other uh, trading posts around Lake Michigan. It's just that uh, the one in Chicago is the one that worked and all the other ones uh, failed. Um, and so we have this Midwestern landscape. And Cronin's book uh, was a radical, eye-opening re-examination of the history of the United States, uh, where we used to think of cities as being cities, suburbs being suburbs, and the countryside being a third thing. And then eventually we got to the point where we see well, people in the suburbs are commuting into cities, so it's really two parts of a single system. But what Cronin's book does for us uh, when it comes out in the early 90s is it opens our eyes to this, uh, this landscape as a humongous operating system, that the fertility, the remarkable fertility of this landscape in the Midwest its ability to grow food, uh, both in terms of further out cattle, and as you get closer in, uh, wheat and corn and barley and oats and all of these food crops. And then the grid system is a way of managing all of this economic productivity and bringing it back in, funneling it into Chicago. And Chicago is part of this larger system and the landscape is a part of the system of Chicago. Uh, the invention of barbed wire was part of the system. The invention of uh, balloon frame construction is part of the system. Lightweight platform frame construction uh, is part of the system. And you see uh, the radiating roads that bring these commodities in from the hinterland into uh, the city of Chicago. This is one system and it's operating in uh, 
balance, you know, symbiotic balance between the countryside and the city, where uh, raw materials funnel into the city, it gets processed, and then the products go back. So the processed lumber, um, the meat, um, it used to be that they would have cattle drives and they drive the cattle into, into Chicago and uh, process the meat in Chicago and then send it back in refrigerated cars. Um, the, the, but what it takes is you need to quickly settle the landscape. You need to move out the indigenous peoples, the 20 million uh, residents of North America at the time of Columbus's landing is reduced down to about, uh, it's 95%, a lot less, half, half a million people. Um, and you crowd them into reservations and, uh, and then you invent something like the Homestead Act that as long as, uh, as, long as you're a free, a free white man, you can claim land. Uh, in Oklahoma, and and uh, that's where we uh, get the idea of stakeholders. Is you literally go out to a piece of land and you drive a stake, and that becomes your claim on land that has been previously plotted out in a grid. And so you get the extremely rapid development of uh, these towns and the settling of the land, and becomes a productive landscape that feeds this giant system uh, into Chicago. And it, Chicago uh, was established in part early on because of the canal system across upstate New York that connected the waterways of the Great Lakes through Buffalo, across the Erie Canal to the Hudson River and then down to New York. Uh, but very quickly after that, it became all about the railways. And how did the railways finance themselves? The US government, which had funded the plotting of this grid across uh, the Western states, granted this swath of this corridor of land, granted this land to the railway companies based on the promise of building a railway through this corridor and establishing towns at stations regularly spaced. It's with, without this railway system, the land is not worth much. It's just like the streetcars in Los Angeles. Remember that? If you wanted to build real estate uh, in Los Angeles, you purchase the uh, farmland or the desert and you build a streetcar. Now that people can get to and from downtown, uh, your houses are worth something. Same thing here. By giving uh, all of this land to the railway companies and promising the railway companies um, based on the promise of building the railway in towns, all of a sudden there's an idea, there's a story that justifies a higher value for this land because it's within striking distance of a railway. So I can grow food, I can grow wheat, and I can bring it to the town, put it on the train, sell it. So the value of this land is what funded the construction of the railway. It's the same financial mechanism as what builds uh, Los Angeles uh, 150 years later. Does that make sense? And so that's how the railways were funded was land speculation. Um, and the city of Chicago uh, is built on the promise of, of these, uh, these grids. Uh, and after the fire of 1871, they rebuilt Chicago, not just as a place of business, but as a place of great culture. And they, uh, we've had this history at least twice before, uh, the, the exposition of 1894. Um, and the invention of the refrigerated car. Uh, the, so the railways change everything. Uh, it turns out someone did the calculation. They always had the, the cattle come to Chicago under their own power because when a cow is alive, their meat doesn't go bad. 
So you keep the cow alive and you march the cow to the slaughterhouse in Chicago until they calculated, some clever person calculated what it cost to feed the cows all the way in versus um, what it would cost to bring the cows up by railway. And they, they found out it's cheaper to put the, car, the cattle in cars and take them to Chicago rather than marching them to Chicago. And so they still keep them alive, the pigs and the cows, they keep them alive, they bring them to Chicago. Then the slaughterhouses of Chicago um, be, are a huge uh, production. These stockyards were famous. People would go to the exposition of 1894, but then the second favorite destination were the great stockyards of Chicago. Um, in Stank, but it was a marvel, it was so big. And uh, this is where the slaughtering uh, would go on. And you see this wheel, um, they march the pigs up to the top of the factory. And um, sorry about this, for, uh, trigger warning. This is about slaughterhouses. But they hang the pig by the the hook at the top, they bring them up here, connected to the wheel, and then the weight of the pig is what turns the wheel. And then they slaughter the pigs on the wheel, but the weight of the, the, the body of the pig is what drives the whole, all the machinery within the factory from that point on. So it's this ingenious, dark uh, machinery of the slaughterhouse. Um, that is dignified by the architecture of this gate. It's a famous uh, architectural monument that uh, puts a civilized face on what was a very brutal undertaking. So it's, it's again this portrait of the grid as this system that at multiple scales is the key to extracting wealth out of the landscape. It's one giant operating system tied together at every scale with the grid. And it's something that can quickly replicate. It's something that can be controlled uh, by a few individuals uh, with accounting sheets, which again is another grid. Um, and so it's the power of these operating systems all pulled together by the ability to replicate itself. Um, not just architecturally, but tied with the architecture are all these systems of reproduction, where it's very quick, very easy, very cheap to reproduce these systems and to trade it as a commodity, as if every element is identical to every other element, which is the essential characteristic of uh, the operating system that makes it so financially profitable. And those of you who uh, were looking at the souls reading the zombies, icebergs, and ultra things, he talks in that about how important it is for all the houses of these investments to be identical, to be indistinguishable from each other. It's the same spirit of the grid operating in the mechanisms of financialization that is exploding today. Um, and is causing a great deal of concern. So once again, we're left at this juncture by asking the question we've been asking all semester long. Thank you very much for this dark, depressing history of how architecture has been uh, part of the systems of oppression and uh, negativity. The challenge for you guys uh, is to, can you take these powerful systems that are embedded in the operations of architecture and turn them around and have them actually do positive things the way we saw in Medellin, Colombia? So here's one. Here's uh, the super block idea of Barcelona, which they tried it in one place. They took a three by three uh, grid of blocks, so Serdaz grid. And they, they uh, pedestrianize 
uh, the inner areas, just like in Groningen in the Netherlands, uh, you can drive here, you can get to every place in here, but you can't drive through. You can you can deliver furniture and then you can leave. You know, you can, but I, I'm pretty sure, I think that it's blocked here. So you can't you can't get through here with the vehicle unless it's a bicycle. So you can pass through here on uh, human powered vehicles and on your own power, but you can't drive through. So that tames this inner area and it creates these four nodes inside the block. And they did it once and it was good. And so they did it again and it was better. And they proposed doing it in 500 places across Barcelona. And so this is an example of something that you try it, you like it. It's the same formula. You can just push, copy, and paste and just replicate it across the grid, across the city. So that's that's the kind of thing. Um, and then I'm curious about the oh, I'm sorry. I've been, I'm curious about the Dutch street system that uh, there's uh, a formula where you, you reestablish the street walls and we're doing this in Boston. So one of the, the building types that I think is worth looking at are the, um, the one plus threes and the one plus fours and the one plus fives where you have a, a base that's that's built with a concrete frame or a steel frame, and it has retail in it, and then it has three, four, five stories of wood frame housing above it. And this is a prototype that was tested out in the 90s, and it worked, and it was written into the zoning code so that mixed use areas could take advantage of it. And the overlay mixed use overlay zoning uh, code has been uh, replicated in towns throughout the United States. And this architectural typology is now being reproduced by developers for profit with some support, but it's, it's uh, quickly remaking the neighborhoods of Boston in particular. Um, so this is another thing that is very interesting. It's similar to what we saw in the Netherlands a hundred years ago, where they rejected the elimination of street walls and streets as outdoor rooms, and they embraced the tr transformation of streets into public living rooms with private gardens inside the block. And that's something that has gone viral throughout the Netherlands uh, as the reclaiming of public space. Someone asked me yesterday, what's the punchline of this course? And I found myself saying, it's what the Dutch do where they transform their streets into public gardens. Uh, it's not car free, but it's car polite. Uh, and uh, it's something that's available to us. And it is going viral in cities throughout Europe. Uh, it could go viral in cities throughout the United States. Okay, out of time. Thank you everyone.